I will awaken the dawn as my prayer ascends to you. Our five week Easter sermon series, which is entitled His Story. On March 8th, our sermon was The Word of God Testifies About Jesus, and that was in John 1 1 through 18. Today, on March 15th, the sermon is John the Baptist Testifies About Jesus, and that's John 1, 6 through 8, 15, and 19 through 34. On March 22nd, the sermon will be The Heavenly Father Testifies About Jesus, and that'll be John 5, 33 through 47. And March 29th, The People Testify About Jesus, that'll be John chapter 12, 12 through 19, and that will be Palm Sunday. And then April 5th, Jesus testifies about Jesus. We'll be in John 20, 1 through 18, and that'll be in our outdoor worship service. On our next slide, you'll see today's sermon title and passage, John the Baptist testifies about Jesus. John the Baptist testifies about Jesus. We'll be in John 1, 6 through 8, 15, and 19 through 34. So please open your Bibles, if you will, to John chapter 1, beginning in verse 6. If you did not bring a Bible with you today, we have the passage up on the screens for you. Beginning in verse 6 of John 1. There came a man sent from God whose name was John, meaning John the Baptist. Verse 7, he came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light. But he came to testify about the light. Now verse 15. John testified about him and cried out saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. Now picking up in verse 19. This is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent to him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? And he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. They asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you so that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? He said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him and said to him, Why then are you baptizing if you are not the Christ, not Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them saying, I baptize in water, but among you stands one whom you do not know. It is he who comes after me, the thong of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he on behalf of whom I said, After me comes a man who has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. I did not recognize him, but so that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing in water. John testified, saying, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. I did not recognize him, but he who sent me... To baptize in water said to me, He upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. There are three major components of the life of John the Baptist. First, John baptizes in water for the living Christ. Second, he heralds or announces the living Christ. Third, he dies for the living Christ. He is actually martyred 
for Jesus. We will see all three of these sections in our sermon today. First, John the Baptist and his baptizing in water was in the Jordan River. John the Baptist baptized with water. Jesus, he said, would baptize with the Holy Spirit. John baptized in a very special and unique way. That is why he is called John the Baptist. John's mode of baptism was by full immersion in water. How do we know that? Simply because of what the word baptism means in Greek. The Greek word for baptism is baptizo. It means to fully immerse or submerse under a liquid. So when you are baptizing someone in water, you take them down into the water. You immerse them under the liquid fully and then raise them up again. Water baptism also symbolizes death. That is why I always use Romans 6, 4 when I'm baptizing someone in water. I'll end up after saying, have you put your personal faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Yes, sir. Are you also coming today to follow your Lord in full immersion believers baptism? Yes. Based on that public profession of faith, my brother or my sister, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which is part of the Great Commission. I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit, buried with Christ in His death, raised to walk in new life. Not every pastor does that when they're doing water baptisms, but we need to show that symbolic act as happening as part of that baptism. The person goes under the water symbolizing their death. They come up out of the water symbolizing their new life in Christ. Also, when we baptize in water, it is signifying that a person's sins are being washed away. When a person washes, they wash their entire body with water. Amen? How else can you get fully clean if you do not wash with water over all of your entire body? You can't. Can you imagine someone going to take a bath to cleanse themselves and they cleaned only their forehead? Of course not. To bathe, to cleanse, is to wash your entire body with water. You want your whole body to be cleansed, amen? Amen. It's the same with your soul. Do you want to cleanse a portion of it or do you want to cleanse all of it? When you come to faith, trust and belief in Jesus Christ as your Savior, your whole soul is cleansed, not a portion So when we symbolize a baptism, you've been washed of your sins, all of you. It's just symbolic. But we carry you fully under the water to symbolize cleansing you fully so that you're clean. And then also that you were dead and buried as if in a tomb or a grave. And you were raised now to new life. So baptism, water baptism, has two important pieces of symbolism. Of course, we know that baptism does not save anyone. That's why we call it believer's baptism. The people that are coming out to see John the Baptist to be baptized first heard John's message about repentance and believing in God. So the person became a believer and then went out to John the Baptist and publicly professed their new salvation and was baptized fully in water. And isn't it significant that John is not just called John? John is called John the Baptist. He is not called John the Methodist. He's not called John the Presbyterian. He's not called John the Lutheran. He's not called John the Episcopal. He's called John the Baptist. And there's a reason for that. It's because of his declaring to the world the biblical mode of baptism, baptizo, to fully immerse or submerse under a liquid. And we know that liquid is water. Second, John the Baptist was a herald. He proclaimed, he announced Jesus as the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. You know, there is a pattern in the New Testament. You may have seen it, you may have not. But Jesus has always had someone very significant to herald him, to announce him at certain stages along the way in his earthly life and ministry. These announcements were to proclaim and establish who he is, his person, his name, his deity, his position, his title, his authority, his glory, 
and His promises. For instance, before Jesus was even conceived, an angel from heaven came to Mary and Joseph and announced that Jesus would be born to them. At Jesus' birth, angels came and announced His birth to the shepherds at Bethlehem. At the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry, John the Baptist announced that Jesus was the Lamb of God sent to take away the sin of the world. At Jesus' baptism by John the Baptist, Jesus' heavenly Father verbally spoke from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. At Jesus' transfiguration into His glory on the amount of transfiguration, Jesus' heavenly Father once again spoke and announced that this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to Him. At Jesus' resurrection, angels came and announced outside of His tomb that Jesus had indeed risen from the dead just as He said He would. This is very, very significant. Jesus had heralds, those who would announce him and announce who he was at very important and critical and crucial points of Jesus' lifespan on earth. Why? Because very important people are announced first. Have you ever heard of a keynote speaker? Someone gets up and gives the keynote address and then the main speaker of the event comes up. There is someone who stands up and gives an announcement of them and tells about them before they speak. One of the things that's always kind of made me a little nervous whenever I've been asked to speak at other churches is that sometimes the pastor wants to get up and he wants to talk about Pastor Bruce. And he's known me for years and he wants to go on and on about me. And oh, he's just such a lovely man, such a wonderful man. And he loves God with all of his heart. And he starts to give my credentials and he starts to give this and he starts to give that. And all of that just makes me all uncomfortable. I'm ready for us to just get to the point of introducing me and let me preach about Jesus and his credentials. Amen? So sometimes I'll even go somewhere and tell the guy, don't go on and on and on about me. The morning is not about me. Just get up and announce me. I'm fine if you just get up and announce me. I'll come up and start preaching because we need to get to the main point quickly. We need to get to the main point, which is Jesus. Concerning John the Baptist, Jesus says something that he is recorded that he said about this one man only. Jesus did not say this about any other man on the face of the earth. Jesus said of John the Baptist, there will never be a man born of a woman any greater than John the Baptist. Jesus never said anything like that about any of the prophets. He never said anything like that about any of the apostles. He never said anything like that about the writers of the New Testament. Of John the Baptist, he said, there will never be a man born of a woman like John the Baptist. John the Baptist did not write any books in the New Testament. He simply heralds, he simply announces who Jesus is and told the people around him to go follow him. Isn't it amazing that we see a guy in the ministry here in the New Testament, where he had his ministry going, and it was going strong, so much so it caught the attention of the Pharisees and Sadducees. They sent people out there to check up on this guy. Who are you? Because we got a lot of people leaving the synagogues here going out to see you. We, we, we need to know who you are, and what are you doing, and why do you claim to be able to do what you do? Who are you? And so they sent a group of delegates out there to find out. Because he was really making a stir. People were coming to him and coming to Christ. And he was baptizing all of these people and it kind of got him concerned. Isn't it amazing though when we read the text that John the Baptist didn't just try to keep his disciples for himself. When he finally saw Jesus walk up, he saw the Lamb of God walk up. He goes, behold, the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. What do you think his disciples did? They left John the Baptist in his ministry. And they went over to Christ and followed Jesus in his ministry. Not too many ministry leaders today want to give up their disciples. But John the Baptist was an humble man. The only reason he had a ministry was to lead people to the living Christ, the Lamb of God. And when he finally saw him, why are you hanging out with me? Leave me, go to him. 
I wonder today if some pastors, even if Jesus was to show up, would want to keep all of the disciples for ourselves. We wouldn't want our ministries to get smaller. We wouldn't want our churches to shrink. Because we'd want to say, well, yeah, he is the Savior of the world, but you can worship him from here. Right? Would we send those disciples straight over to the living Lord? We ended at verse 34 earlier in our main text. If we were to continue on in verse 35, we would see John do this. John sent his disciples away to follow the Messiah, to follow Jesus Christ. I'll be reading to you out of John 1, starting in 35 and going through verse 41. Now, this is where Jesus' public ministry and his converts are occurring and he's about to choose his apostles. Watch how they leave John the Baptist and they attach to the Christ, attach to the Messiah and begin to follow Jesus now instead of John the Baptist. Verse 35, again the next day John, meaning John the Baptist, was standing with two of his disciples. These disciples were following John the Baptist. Verse 36, and he looked at Jesus as he walked and said, behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus, meaning they walked away from John the Baptist and followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Now listen closely to verse 41. He found first his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah. Which translated means the Christ. John the Baptist's ministry was being fulfilled at that point. He had been the forerunner of Jesus Christ. He's been the herald, the one to announce that the Christ would come, the Messiah would come, and they were to follow him. So automatically when Andrew sees him, he said he found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which translated means the Christ. Can you imagine the joy? They've been hearing about the Messiah, hearing about the Messiah, hearing about the Messiah, and they found him. So there was the transfer, the transfer of John's disciples to become Jesus' disciples. Do you know what Jesus said about John the Baptist? How did the first apostles come to Jesus? Through the ministry of John the Baptist. Third, John the Baptist died as a martyr for Jesus Christ. John the Baptist had one of the greatest ministries in all of the Bible and then he was beheaded in his own ministry. Listen to the story of how John the Baptist's life ended. I'm in Mark 6, 17 through 29 in the NASB. Verse 17, For Herod himself had sent and had John arrested and bound in prison on account of Herodias, the wife of his brother Philip, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death and could not do so. For Herod was afraid of John, knowing that he was a righteous and a holy man, and he kept him safe. And when he heard him, he was very perplexed, but he used to enjoy listening to him. A strategic day came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his lords and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. And when the daughter of Herodias herself came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guest. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you want, and I will give it to you. Verse 23, And he swore to her, Whatever you ask of me, I will give it to you up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, What shall I ask for? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. Immediately she came in a hurry to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And although the king was very sorry, yet because of his oaths and because of his dinner guest, he was unwilling to refuse her. Immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded him to bring back his head. And he went and had him beheaded in the prison and brought his head on a platter. And gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about this, they came and took away his body and laid it in a tomb. 
So how did the first apostles hear about Jesus Christ originally? Through John the Baptist. How do people hear about Jesus Christ today? Through you and me. Through the ministry of Christians. We have the Great Commission. We are ambassadors of Jesus. We, like John the Baptist, go and share with others about Jesus. We as Christians point the way to Jesus. We say, look here in the Bible. Jesus Christ came to die on the cross for you. He died for you. He paid the penalty for all of your sins. Believe in Him and follow Him in believer's baptism. You know what's surprising to me about this? We can testify about so many other things. Don't we, don't we testify about football scores? Don't we testify about that latest meal we ate? Don't we testify about that restaurant? Don't we testify about this? Testify about that? We testify on Facebook. We testify everywhere about all kinds of things. But did you know what one of the hardest words is to say in our culture? Jesus. Jesus. You go out and you try to talk about Jesus in the public around people. Do you feel all tight inside? Do you feel like, oh, it's just going to be hard for me to share? I don't know what they're going to think, or I don't know what they personally believe, or I don't know what this is going to cause. If it's going to cause a problem, do you feel all that resistance? That is satanic work going to work against your spirit so that you will not name the Lamb of God, the Son of God, that you will not tell people, here is who the Messiah is. He is the answer for all of life. Did you, have you ever noticed that it's easier to invite somebody to church than to mention Jesus? It's because of the difference of the name of Christ. There's spiritual warfare that goes on in our souls and our spirits about the risen Christ. Don't we love to get together and chatter? I mean, like we said, we chatter and all about all kinds of things. We testify about all kinds of things. When is the Christian church going to start to testify about the Lamb of God, about the Son of God? People that are in Islam, they testify readily about what they believe. People that are Buddhist testify readily about what they believe. People that are Hindu testify readily about what they believe. Atheists are very outspoken. They testify readily about what they believe. Who are some of the most quiet people on the planet? Christians who are the only ones that know the real, true, living God. We get really disappointed, we get really upset, and we get really frustrated at what we see going on in our world. We've read the end of the Bible and we know what happens. And we see the world getting worse. I don't know how many people are coming up to me now going, Pastor, do you think we're in the end times? Do you think this is going to be it? I think we're really here. You know, I know a lot of other generations thought so too, but I think we're really here. Every generation has thought that, and we may be. I don't know. But that's not what you need to be concerned about. What you need to be concerned about is the fact that are you sharing about the risen Christ, whether it is end times or not? Because I can guarantee you this, you're getting close to the end time of your life. You know what? One of the, one of the things that I love about some of these ministers that were in the 1700s and 1800s, what we call the great revivals, the great spiritual awakenings, the first great awakening, the second spiritual awakening, is because these men, though dead, still speak. They lived in such a way that they spoke about Christ, not to build big churches, not to be fancy, not to be well-known or for fame. They really just preached the Word of God so that who all was in their sphere of influence would hear about him how could people that were dead and gone and we didn't even have really good ways to press things and have newspapers and bibles we didn't have a really good system back then how do we have so much in print about charles spurgeon about charles finney about jonathan edwards about all of these great men george whitfield how do we have so much information on these guys it's because they were heralds of jesus they were announcers of jesus and that's what we've lost in our generation you know what's really killing us Religious tolerance. Religious tolerance. Do you know what religious tolerance is? It's to know that all of these plethora of false religions are around us and we stay silent. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, we're supposed to speak the truth in love. So you're not supposed to go out and be mean and rude and hateful and unkind. That's not our Jesus. 
We are to speak the truth in love. But when you're around your Muslim friends, when you're around your Buddhist friends, when you're around your Hindu friends, when you're around your agnostic friends, when you're around your atheist friends, when you're around your humanistic friends, talk about Jesus. Figure out how to get the topic on to what's important. Wouldn't it be a shame to stand before the Lamb of God? One day, and he said, you mean to tell me you were friends with that person for 25 years? And you never, ever, ever got around to mentioning my name? What are you going to do at Easter time this year? A lot of people focus on Lent. What can I remove from my life so I can get more holy? And then right after Easter's over, we go back to doing all of those things that we set aside just for Lent. We live it up again right after April 5th. That's not the point. What is the point? We need to live holy every day, 365 days a year, not just 30 days before Easter. Amen. Right? Some of you look awesome in here on Sunday mornings. You put on your best life on Sunday mornings. What's your Monday like at home? What's your Tuesday like at the office? What's your Friday night out on the town? Because you look great in here on Sunday. But you know, Jesus knows your whereabouts seven days a week, every day that ends in Y. So we really need to be testifying. All of you go places all week long that I don't go. I'm responsible for the people in my spheres of influence. And at Easter time, I'm not just wanting to testify about Jesus to people who already know about Jesus. I want to testify about Jesus to people that don't know my Jesus. Is that your heart? If you leave this worship service today... And you don't have a desire to go back to your office tomorrow, to go back to that mall on Tuesday, to go back to those family relatives on Wednesday. If you don't have a desire to go back to wherever it is you go, and Jesus is not what you want to tell them, premier, first of all, there's a problem. You're being conformed by the world. You're enjoying the world. But you're supposed to be having a transformed mind. And a transformed mind to the living Lamb of God wants you to go and to talk about Him. Did you know when we're going to realize when we should have shared the most about Jesus? Two seconds after you're dead. That's when we're going to realize that was what it was all about. That was what it was all about. I didn't know. I spent 85 years here and it was about my job, my family, my money, my retirement, my entertainment. My hobby, my sleep, my whatever. Two seconds after you die, you're going to get what it's all about. And you can't go back. Paul knew this. And when he shared the gospel with people, he told the Jews, your blood's no longer on my hands. I've told you. How many people have you not told about Jesus? God holds us accountable for souls. Did you know that? How could God give us the great commission and there not be any accountability? Go therefore into all nations and make disciples, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Go be disciple makers. But you just go, well, that's not part of my deal. That's what the professional clergy pastor does. You've been given the Great Commission. If you were to raise your hand, if I were to ask you, raise your hand if you've been given the Great Commission. When you stand before Christ and he asks for an account of what disciples you've been making, what you going to say? You can't snow him. You can't trick him. You can't talk him out of it. You can't say, let me come back later and we'll talk about this and let me figure out a good... Answer and response. It's on the spot, face to face. Where are we being accountable to the gospel? John the Baptist was a man that was holy in life and deed and practice, but also in his testifying, in his proclamation, in his announcing. This Easter, are you going to testify about Jesus as John the Baptist did? Is your faith going to be private? or public our world doesn't know what to believe anymore there are so many religions and faiths to believe in nowadays 
Who are people to believe in? They are to believe in the one and only true God, Jesus Christ. But you cannot share with others what you do not possess. If you have not come to believe in Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you can believe in Him, put your faith and trust in Him today. Come forward and allow me to share with you how Jesus Christ can be your Lord and your Savior today. Let's pray together. Today is the day of salvation. Come as God leads you.